What's up, y'all? My guest today is Dr. Laura Robinson, who is a fantastic individual, an incredibly bright person, and just the best pop culture film theology nerd, really, that I know. So I'm so excited to talk with her about The Exorcist. Her favorite movie, one of my favorite movies, and certainly one of the top horror movies of all time. You can make an argument for Halloween. I think that's my favorite. I think Dawn of the Dead is in there, Texas Chainsaw. I know a lot of people like Hereditary and some more modern kind of stuff. But The Exorcist is really the granddaddy of possession movies and really started a whole thing. And so we dive into some really cool stuff with this episode. Uh, my hot take is that The Exorcist is a Christian movie. Maybe you agree or maybe you disagree. But we talk about some of the themes of evil, redemption, some of the vileness. What is the history of the movie? What was the movie's impact on American society? We really unpack it all and talking about the novelist and everything else that involves uh, The Exorcist. It's a really great conversation, and I hope you enjoy. I think it's working. Yeah, there we okay. go. <laughs> What's up, y'all? I'm here with the one and only Dr. Laura Robinson. Dr. Robinson, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I, I think if my computer's oh, taking a little second to catch up. Got a little up. glitch. Uh, I know. I was like, as you were saying. <laughs> little, okay, there we go. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You know, I think as you were saying earlier, what else would we expect from an exorcist show but a ton of technical problems? Absolutely. So. <laughs> there's there's no other way to describe it. There's no other way that it would go. But Dr. Laura and I are having a chance to sit and talk about one of my favorite scary movies. One of my favorite movies. Oh, it is my all time. It's yeah. Exorcist is by far my all time. I love it so much. I love the book. I love the story behind it. I love I love everything about the Exorcist. I'm a huge fan girl. Yeah, and so we get a chance to just like do a little little spooky movie pod and unpack the yeah. Exorcist, which in my opinion, and we shared this before the show, like it's a Christian movie. The Exorcist is oh, a yeah. Christian movie. That's like one hundred percent my my hot take on this. Yes. Uh, but yeah, what, I Tell us the story a little bit behind it, because I think it would help people yeah. to like to to understand how it all comes together and what made the Exorcist the Exorcist. No, for sure, because the the story behind it is is pretty interesting, I think, and is often, you know, when you say that, like, you know, the Exorcist is undeniably a Christian movie. I think part of why people might be confused by that is because people don't really know where this came from. So the Exorcist was uh, William Peter Blady was at George. He's the author of the novel. The Exorcist is based on it. The movie is based on a novel. He was at Georgetown. He's a good Catholic kid. Uh, when he heard about the fact that there was um, in St. Louis at the time, there was the first uh, official Catholic exorcism in North America. It happened while he was at Georgetown in the late wow. 60s. So this was really interesting because this is right after Vatican II. When you have, you know, like the, the Catholic Church is really thinking a lot about modernizing and, you know, the role of religious institutions and the role of religious orders at this time. So in the midst of all of this, uh, you know, like a vernacular mass, like all these modernizing uh, impulses, suddenly the Catholic Church has a straight up bona fide exorcism. Wow. That is, if you know the story of the movie, even you've seen this, is incredibly difficult to get. So... Blady was fascinated by this. And what he originally set out to do was to write a nonfiction article in great detail explaining this story. Um, especially because, like, a big part of the way he was thinking about this was that, like, if you could tell this story, this would solidify to people, like, why faith is so important, that there still is this, like, supernatural evil problem in the world that has to get solved. So he tried to get the case files, um, and he couldn't do it because of privacy concerns. Uh, the exorcism involved a 14 year old boy. It's a girl in the book. Yeah. Uh, and there were there were a ton of privacy concerns. Some of it has since been um, open to the public. And we actually do know more about the story that The Exorcist is based on. But at the time, it was completely sealed. So Blady decides that if he can't do a nonfiction version, he's going to do a fictional version. He's going to write a novel based on what he thinks happened. And he sets out very much to tell a story where a priest is a hero. That's the thing that's really important to him. That mm. a priest has this heroic presence in the story and like overcomes uh, doubt and depression and trauma in his own life to become this heroic figure in the face of satanic evil. So that's yeah. like what Blady sets out to do. So he writes his novel. 
Um, it's a smash hit book. It sells incredibly quickly and is picked up very fast uh, by people who are interested in making the movie, right? Of course. So only, only like a year and a half after the book drops is when the movie comes out. And of course, you know, famously, if the book was a blockbuster, then what is the movie? The movie is probably the most influential American movie other than Godfather. One in three American adults went to go see Exorcist in theaters. Whoa! <laughs> That's crazy! It's insane how influential this movie is. It was the, um, for a long, long time, I think it still is if you adjust for inflation, it was the highest grossing R-rated movie mm. ever. Um, it, 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 the record was undefeated until Passion of the Christ came out. Like, yeah. this movie is insanely influential. Everyone goes to see in a big part of the, you, you know, of the of the popular yeah. culture enthusiasm around The Exorcist is the fact that people were having these crazy reactions. Yes, because The Exorcist is best known and loved and hated for its insane practical effects. The Exorcist yep. has some of the greatest practical effects in cinema history, and they are so gross. Uh, it's <laughs> disgusting. I mean, even today, it's like fifty years yeah. old. And it's, yeah. it is a truly disgusting and scary movie. And you see those reactions. Yes. You watch the news of it of like people are passing out in theaters for this movie. It, yeah. It's like a phenomenon. It's a viral phenomenon. Yeah. The B-roll is crazy that it about – and you can watch reporters get wise to how this is happening. That at about the 90-minute mark in the movie, people start running out of the exorcist yeah. because that's the, um, that's the crucifix scene. Yeah. Right? You know, and, and people are having these it, – it, it's still it, it's still a taboo – breaking aggressive film today you know nowadays i think people don't quite have the same yeah you know yeah. obviously it's it's hard to imagine a movie that would make people run out into the audience like through, through the yeah. aisles screaming to today be truly yeah. shocking to be a true yeah. shocking movie it would be really hard to yeah. imagine what you could do for that right to happen. yeah well and, and i think a big part of why the exorcist hit as hard as it did is because just not even the content but just visually people had never seen anything like yeah, that before that's true that at the time you know like how you make a bed raise and shake was a tough question for effects teams right like a lot of this was still hard to figure out how to make reagan yeah. float yeah was a tough question um you know a lot of uh some of the contortion effects were done with a gymnast body double uh, but a lot of it is just linda blair just wow. you know just going to town like, yeah. or sometimes wearing a harness she wears a harness for some screen scenes that kind of like pull her around a little right. bit more to create more of the out of control look but visually it's an incredibly difficult movie and then um of course you know then then comes the backlash right is that you have this yeah. movie that is incredibly famous is everybody goes to see it it's incredibly influential and there's a lot of um conversation in the midst of this of this idea that like whether or not seeing The Exorcist is dangerous, mm -hmm. right? So, like, Billy Graham uh, says that people are at risk of becoming possessed or having demons brought into their life by virtue of Billy? watching The Exorcist. Billy! Oh, Billy! The okay. We forget, we forget what a hellfire and brimstone fella he was in 1973, yeah. right? <laughs> he was, it was a different Billy. Uh, but, no, like, pa pastors are warning about people being demonized and, like, just, like, the insane evil of this movie. And Blady was actually really struggled with these reactions because Blady wrote this story with the goal of inspiring faith and with yeah. the goal and, and if you watch the whole movie through you can see what Blady was going for yeah. but if all you know about this movie is people you know is a girl with her head turning around stabbing herself with the crucifix right. and people running out in the audience you know vomiting and screaming and you know then it, it probably seems baffling of like how on earth could this possibly be a Christian movie if you watch the whole way through you can see what he went for but he was really i i think you know and we can talk about this our, our different reactions to the exorcist i think that um there's a there's a fundamental tension at the heart of this story mm. which is what blady wanted to wanted you to feel in response to this and the content that was necessary to create this story right yeah. because pazuzu the demon in question is um is is horrible 
Yeah. It is absolutely, it is so perverse and gross and disgusting and like hates people, hates children. And, and like it uses like hideous language and uh, and makes people do hideous things and is just so twisted. Um, which you need that scale of evil to create the drama and the heroism of these characters coming up and taking this thing on and fighting yeah. it. Yeah. And at the same time, I see why it just like, I see why it's like a first bite of like incredibly spicy food and it just burns your taste buds off and yeah. you can't catch everything else because the imagery is so hideous. Right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so I encountered, mm -hmm. so I didn't grow up in church. And so hearing mm -hmm. about the exorcist, it purely not as a religious text, but just as the Mount Everest peak mm -hmm. of scary movies, just mm -hmm. the like, Hey, and I, my parents didn't have any like, you can't watch this, you can't watch that. So I'm watching mm -hmm. Friday the 13th when I'm a little kid and I'm watching mm -hmm. Halloween and I'm watching all these scary movies. And the ex I didn't watch The Exorcist. I, I waited because mm -hmm. I'm like, this is like the pinnacle of all yeah. of this. And eventually I yeah. watch it and I'm like, it's really scary. It's like, yeah. legit it's, it's a legitimately unsettling kind of scary yeah. movie. And you get, you get jump scares you get truly gross things you get like evil you get some evil yeah. like incarnate kind of stuff and so coming upon it i was like oh yeah that's really scary and then as i you know eventually find faith and kind of come closer to that and as i've been a pastor i kind of come back to revisit it recently mm -hmm. and i'm and i watched it and i'm like this is a very faith affirming film Mm -hmm. when you watch it the mm -hmm. whole way through for what it is, mm -hmm. not the sound bites, not the thing. When you yeah. watch it through for what it is, I get the intention. I get the author's intention yes. of the, the, the priest is the hero. The mm -hmm. priests are the heroes of this and they're complicated seventies heroes. And so mm -hmm. you have the, like this cinema era, right. Of these like complicated anti-hero -y kind of guys. And so mm -hmm. you've got a priest that's like, I don't know if I believe anymore. And he goes through this personal tragedy and the thing that I think, that, which is super cool, like uh, meaning that it's very real and it's very grounded, mm -hmm. but then you've got Chris and Reagan and you've got a modern woman and mm -hmm. a very like empowered, independent kind of woman. And, and in, in the late sixties when the book was written in early seventies, like that's like, that's pretty. The fact that she was divorced is a huge taboo that they bring up again and again. It's, a that it's, it's such a cutting you know. edge, like actual thing. But he treats her with respect, not mm -hmm. as, oh, this woman's horrible choices are the reason mm -hmm. this daughter has been corrupted. Like he treats her with a dignity and it shows through her lens how she's being kind of belittled by so many men in this world as she's rich and she's mm -hmm. powerful but the men are still talking down to her and so mm -hmm. it allows for the this complex mosaic of people coming together and it what it kind of said to me why it's faith affirming is like evil isn't worried about your liberal or conservative or democrat or republican or rich or poor or your science or your catholic evil is real so what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. And I, I think it takes great faith from someone like Chris. And it, it, to me, like biblical faith, it's like a one of the stories that Jesus tells, right? Of a woman who's like, I, I don't care who you are. Get this thing out of my daughter. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. that is so affirming in a lot of ways in faith. But it has been treated as like, oh, are you are you sure you're a Christian pastor? You watch The Exorcist, <laughs> right? It's so gross. It's so yeah, no, exactly. It's so maybe maybe it would be helpful to give a lot of people know The Exorcist by visuals, but they don't know the story. Maybe sure. would it help if I just gave a little synopsis yes, really fast absolutely. of what? Yeah, Let's walk us so through the story. Super. So the story of The Exorcist is there's there's basically four main characters at the heart of this. Uh, there is this the one of the major characters is this lady named Chris McNeil. She is a famous actress. She is recently divorced. Her husband, it, her ex-husband is not very involved in uh, her life or her daughter's life. This is continuously frustrating for him. But she is trying to get back on the horse with performing by doing this movie that is set in Georgetown. So she's away from home. She is renting this house with with some of her household staff and she has this very sheltered daughter who she's really trying to like basically nurture apart from all the like 
chaos of the urban world and the Hollywood uh, in Hollywood. Yeah. And, yeah, and the changing times and all that yeah. stuff. He's she's really try, she has so she has this twelve year old daughter whose name is Reagan and she's the sweetest little thing, and she and she's a, a wonderful mother and she is sort of you know, Chris struggles a lot with the fact that people have a lot of ex expectations about what a famous actress would be like or what a divorced woman would be like, but she's really she tries really hard to be a good mom, and Reagan of course gets very sick with something that makes no sense and reagan starts acting in ways that are incredibly bizarre and frightening and terrifying and there a ton of the movie is just chris trying to get doctors to take her seriously mm -hmm. about what's happening before we even see possession happening yeah so um meanwhile they're in georgetown uh Chris is neighbors and friends through a network with a man named Damien Karras. Damien Karras is a local, uh, he has an MD in addition to being a Jesuit. He is a psychiatrist by training. And he is um, initially kind of like starstruck by Chris, but they become friendly. Um, and he is going through this major faith crisis at the time. And he is not really, he's, he's going through a lot of trauma because his mother has late stage dementia. And this is really bothering him and testing his faith. Yeah. Um, so he's got that going on. And then the fourth character who gets introduced eventually is a man named Father Karras. Father Karras is sort of the anti-Vatican II, we might say. That, like, if yeah. Karis is this very Father modern... Father Marin. Father Marin. Father Marin, yeah, yeah, Father yeah. Marin. Sorry, yeah. But if, if Karis is this very, like, uh, modern, medically educated, psychiatrically aware priest, Marin is Mr. Old School. We spend the first 20 minutes with this guy. He's on an archaeological dig in a rock trying to find a demon named Pazuzu who makes like dogs fight and crazy things. Like, yeah. He is oh. he is Mr. Old School. And he uh, finally, you know, once Karis becomes involved in the story originally through the psyche when what's Karis is called to be involved because of his experience with the, as a priest and because he is psychiatrically trained yeah and chris starts asking for an exorcism Marin is basically the only man in the world who is qualified to do an exorcism in this very modern era because mm. priests aren't normally trained to do this so that's how Marin gets involved in the story and you know Marin's not just the only exorcist in the world. He is a man with a personal beef with this demon. Yes. <laughs> it's a it's a great story. It's, it's an his absolute Moby like, Dick. yes. It's his it Moby is. Dick. It is. He totally is. That like he's been trying to get Bazuzu for decades. And you know, and he gets brought into this story and he's just he's played by Max von Saito, who was only 42 when they filmed it. Is it crazy. blew my mind. It blew my mind because as a kid, I'm I always like, who's this old man? And I'm like, this old yeah. man's still around and he looks younger now than he did in yeah. the Exorcist. And I didn't realize that he was in old age. Like He's in amazing and... old age makeup. And he's playing the fr frailty very, very well. No, he was only 42. Um, but he's great. And he basically looks exactly the same in Force Awakens, which I think was his last movie part. But uh, yeah. anyway, so That's yeah. True. Yeah, but but it's um so that's that's the story. Those are the you know Chris and Reagan are not religious. They come to accept the idea of an exorcism originally because of um a psychiatrist says that it might have a really powerful placebo effect. Mm -hmm. Um, which you know there's a lot of interplay with that. That Karis is sort of horrified at the idea of doing an exorcism as a placebo ritual. That yeah. he's worried it'll create you know new compulsions for someone who he still thinks is mentally ill and of course you know chris eventually comes to be completely persuaded that her daughter is in fact possessed even though she's not um religious even, even though she's not religious and then of course yeah. Marin comes to the scene and is like not just she's not mentally ill she's possessed but also i know who this demon is and i've been yeah. trailing it for a while <laughs> yeah. i'm hot on a trail i know who this is i mean in that way, it plays like almost like Silence of the Lambs, almost like a serial yeah. killer thing where he's like yeah. the, he's the profiler and yeah. he understands the the footprint yeah. and the, the fingerprints of this. Yeah, no, exactly. Because like the the scene where they're like one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when they're suiting up to go in and do the exorcism and they're putting their vestments on, like they're putting their flak jackets on, like they're yeah. going to war. And it it's is like the Rambo scene before the Rambo scene. Like it's, it's very so much so cool. adventure, like Bandolero, <laughs> like except with that, with not bullets, it's crosses and it's exactly. like all the Catholic liturg liturgical uh, stuff. 
it's so cool and, yeah. and, it, and it's also in, in the way he's like briefing Marin through this about like the way it works right that you know he he lies to deceive you and like you know we can't ask it too many questions because it's going to try to throw stuff out to confuse us but then it's going to start mixing the truth to attack us mm. and they're like the attack is psychological damien do not listen yeah. you know it's just ah it's so cool <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and of course and of course garris gets in there and he does exactly what you know he's going to do which is listen and yep. <laughs> Yeah, this thrilled. man in a crisis of faith, listening to a demon tell him how uh, he fa- like how he how he is <laughs> failing, right? Oh, it's so I I want everything with because you know the, I mean you might even say the fifth character is just Pazuzu, even though no yeah. actor plays Pazuzu. It's Linda Blair, of course, you know, yeah. and then there's a voice actress who does some of the deeper register uh, tones, uh, but Pazuzu, you know. Pazuzu knows Marin, and Pazuzu is also really crafty because, like, once Marin gets in there and starts throwing holy water around, Pazuzu just turns all his attention on the guy with the faith crisis. Yep. Just that, you know, I maybe can't get the old school priest. I can definitely get this guy. This is know? the weak <laughs> link right here, and I'm going to attack the weak link. Yeah. And he goes, like, all in on him. It's, oh, it's so scary and so good. Yeah. <laughs> but... well, and it's like, but yeah. part of what's scary about it is that psychologically speaking, emotionally speaking, whether you have faith or not, that is everyone's nightmare. To come into a room to try to do your job and help someone. Because what they mm-hmm. do a really good job of in the book that I'm starting to read, right, thanks to your it's recommendation. Really yeah, uh, it's so good. They, they show the empathy of Karis. They show how mm. much he cares about people and how much the suffering of the world, he he hates the suffering of the world almost as passionately mm-hmm. as uh, Marin hates the evil, right? And so mm-hmm. you have one priest who's kind of focused on the evil, one who's focused on the suffering, but but mm-hmm. he makes this character empathetic. And so to ha- to have your worst fears and nightmares, like all the insecurities that you spoken back to you, yeah, is everyone's nightmare. That's a horror movie for everybody. Yeah. No, it's, I think that's, that's so, yeah, that that's so true of like why this is scary. And, and, and I think the, the other thing that's really, it's more in the book, but it is somewhat in the movie, is this fear of the level of control. You know, we know the imagery of like the demon making her head turn around, like Reagan's head turn around, spit vial yeah. and stuff. But the amount of control the demon has over Reagan's body is really terrifying in some different ways because the Reg- the demon can do things like not let her absorb water and can do things like stop her heart and so there's this constant terror of if the exorcism doesn't work and especially if like karis is bringing marin down there's it like like reagan is dying when the exorcism starts like there 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 is a ticking clock that the demon has decided that he is not going to let reagan sleep or absorb any fluids uh and and he's the the demon is just trying to run out the clock he's trying to kill reagan and and it's terrifying because you know again like putting yourself in this character's head in, in in this character's head that you're fighting something that hasn't really been fought openly since the middle ages right. as far as you know right like, you have no education in this you have no training in this and um in in the, the exploration of what an exorcism ritual is that it's part of the way it's understood in this in in, in the story and historically in the theology is that like sometimes it doesn't take the first time sometimes you have to do this a few times and sometimes like in the entire time the demon is fighting back at you and is it's a really terrifying image to like the the level of like stamina it takes to get through this is such mm. a big part of the way the scene is written i mean that you know the, the exorcism the exorcist is famous for a lot of things but like the last most of the iconography comes out of the last 20 minutes um because the last 20 minutes are when marin comes marin's the guy on the cover looking up the yep. stairs yep. and and just they go to town right yep. and then they go get they go fight Pazuzu, and it is just the, the for for a ritual that is reading things out loud and holding up symbols to a small child, they make it look like the most grueling, exhausting, terrifying thing Oof. in the universe. <laughs> like, 
Yes. I mean, you know, yeah. it feels almost like a courtroom scene. Like you make a good courtroom mm. scene, even though it's just dialogue and people are sitting there. It's like a yeah. few good men and that you make it so yeah. intense because of the performances. Like you, mm-hmm. you're just watching people talking, like you said, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden the intensity is ratch- ratcheted up to 11 and people are just yeah. like yelling and like oh, the power of Christ compels you <laughs> right and everything is on and it's on and so I, man everything you're talking about is so dead on and like what how did the movie so the movie you talked a little bit about the backlash a third of americans see it i think that the you know the pastor wordplay that i used was like i think he tried to scare that you know the author tried to scare the hell out of people and i think he scared the hell yeah. into people yeah. And what, like, what was the reaction to something? Like you said, Billy Graham is going, yeah. hey, don't see it. You might get possessed. And so some people yeah. are going, hey, this is very real, maybe too real, taking it seriously. And yeah. oh, don't open the doors or the windows to something like this, <laughs> right? And Yeah. Uh, which is kind of crazy. And then, but Americans see it. How does religion sit after this like what does like i i don't think there was like a catholic revival after this there so wasn't but there there wasn't but there was a huge kick up in what's called deliverance ministries so um. eventually what this is sort of the beginning of a lot of what would later come to be known as spiritual warfare this was already out there in some ways but because basically what happens after the exorcist comes out is a lot of people decide they need exorcisms and they go to priests and priests are like, did you see the movie? The whole point is we don't do these. Yeah. (laughs) You know, um, the man who plays father Dyer in the exorcist is a real priest. And he actually said that, you know, a conversation he was having constantly after the exorcism, uh, after the exorcist came out, was like, I actually don't do exorcisms. Like, this is not a yeah. part of my job. This isn't part of the soul care I do. So, what eventually happens is that there's a few intersections of like charismatic and evangelical Catholics and Protestants and others who form what is now what what is generally called deliverance ministries is groups of people who will cast out priests and you i mean cast, cast out demons and you can almost make the case that the way this works is that the book the exorcist gets treated like an audubon guide yeah. to demons <laughs> right right <laughs> and, you know i i remember thinking this when um did you listen to the rise and fall of mars hill yeah yeah, that that they talk a bit about some of the demonic stuff that Mark Driscoll claims to see, and I was like, "Is this like a cops watch cops situation where right. like cops start to act like cops? It's like, do demons watch The Exorcist? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> we should like start opening doors and stuff, you know? Yeah, that like a lot of imagery that had previously not really been associated with demons." becomes associated with demons because the exorcist is so huge so a lot of times like what will happen is you you know there's actually a book called american exorcism that is a history of deliverance ministries after the exorcist fascinating book it's an ethnography of all these you should totally check it out that goes through like the the catholic and the protestant forms Mm -hmm. so i think what doesn't I, I think what doesn't happen is what Blady really wanted, which is that people find this like strength in old school doctrine and religious leaders and like, you know, faith in Christ. Um, you know, because like Marin is a, um, Marin, the, 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 the heroic priest in this, in, in The Exorcist, is not a Hellfire and Brimstone character at all. Uh, like when the, when, when mm-hmm. they, they, they read parts of his book in the, in the book, and it's like, it's all about like the love of God and just like, you know, how much Jesus loves us. And then when he explains what possession is, the thing he links it all back to is that like the goal of the devil is to persuade us that God doesn't love us, right? So like mm-hmm. Marin's theology is not fire and brimstone and, and Marin is very much like i think the idealistic catholic figure yeah, for blady yeah. um you know in, 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 in that he, he's 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 the great hero yeah. and like for blady i think catholicism in catholic theology is all about bravery and self-sacrifice and accepting the love of god and accepting the self-sacrifice of god in christ like these are the dominant themes he keeps coming to when he's talking about this right so i think what's really interesting is that that doesn't seem like it actually had a big put a big rise after the exit what happens instead is a lot of interest in demons and a lot of people who want um 
who who want an exorcism and want and, and think an exorcism will solve their problems, yeah. which is you know in, in in the book, you know, an exorcism is so much a the exorcism in the story is a symbol of a larger theological phenomenon Yeah, that the exorcism yeah. in the way that the exorcism actually works. But I think, you know, no one ever accused Americans of not being literal enough. It's <laughs> right. It, but it's like born in the USA becoming a patriotic song. Like exactly. it's, it's, it's like the, we're taking the wrong part of it. Exactly. Going, I think, yeah. Yeah. And we're going, we're taking the exorcist and going, Hey, demons are interesting. Let's think exactly. about it. And it's like, and he's like, no, that's not what I wanted you to do. Right. Yeah. Right. That like, I think the demons become the star of the show and become the star of the afterlife. And then, you know, of course, a, a lot of this could be argued to be the beginnings of what becomes the satanic panic mm. and the sort of in the, in the rise yeah. of the phenomenon of the satanic ritual abuse scare. Yeah. Right. Um, that suddenly, <laughs> suddenly satan has top billing in american religion yeah. which you know is not what blady wanted to have yeah. happen and, it, and in the book and in the movie they do talk about the desecrations right they talk about the desecrations mm -hmm. of altars and and i could totally see the satanic panic and i, I draw a line to something like stranger things where it's like yeah it, it's in horror movies and heavy metal and these kids are sacrificing <laughs> kids out in the woods and there's all this mm -hmm. like there's this like dark movement towards Satan. And you could even start to see some of the QAnon -y, like yeah. kind of conspiracy theorist of yeah. like Johnson and Johnson. I it was John I don't know what company you heard, but I heard it was Johnson yeah. and Johnson. Oh, Procter and Gamble for me. <laughs> Procter and Gamble. That was it. No, it's Procter and Gamble. They're yeah. Satan worshippers. And they yeah. actually sacrifice children in their soap or whatever. And like yeah. you hear these things and a lot of it feels like it could be traced back to this. Yeah. Like very yeah. singularly. Yeah. That it I that's definitely there there is definitely a from Exorcist to QAnon. Yeah. story you could tell of american cultural history i think you know obviously the the roots of QAnon are even deeper in like the medieval like blood libel anti-semitic conspiracy but i think that this the, this sort of newfound fixation on you know exorcist isn't the only culprit right sure. you know because like you do have rosemary's baby around the mm -hmm. same time same thing with the book and a movie uh you do have the omen right uh but yeah. it, i mean the 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 king of the Satan movies is definitely yeah. The Exorcist, though, right? Well, and, yeah, but uh, yeah. I, I, they're coming in this era of the 70s where it's, I mean, you have a lot of movies that are wrestling with evil. Apocalypse mm -hmm. Now. Really, you yeah. could argue that Godfather is wrestling with evil, too. Yeah. Like, what is like, what is evil? And so we're coming, yeah. out of, we're coming out of this era of american innocence there's like the leave it to be rare then there's the hippies yeah and there's vietnam and then we're coming into this new america like it feels yeah. like the america that we live in now is being born out like yeah this this is the cinematic era that shows the america that's being born and what we're wrestling with and the yeah. problem of evil is something that people have wrestled with for all of time and this is just our creative way i mean you talk about dante's inferno you talk about yeah. like a religious text here there everywhere like yeah. it, we're wrestling with the problem of evil and the exorcist has a very uh like the apocalypse now version is very almost anarchic mm -hmm. uh, just like because it's heart of darkness right it's kind of adapted mm -hmm. from that kind of thing and then there's mm -hmm. other like reflections on evil the exorcist is the one that feels like it puts faith first of going yeah. like to your point actual old school religious doctrine and love right because yeah. that's what Marin is representing of like god loves you is yeah. really the way forward and none of these other movies hit there so i that's part no. of why i'm like dude this is a christian movie it just yeah. shows the stuff that is alluded to in other christian yeah movies. well and i also think that another thing that i think is makes blady an interesting figure is that blady wasn't I, I, what I, the way I don't want to misrepresent this is that he kind of had like a pietistic streak. It was just mm. sort of like, oh, we just need to go back into ourselves and accept the love of God. That like, Blady is obsessed with systematic violence yeah. in all of his literature in all of his movies. Like, uh, racial violence is a huge theme in the book Legion, and then the movie which Blady himself directed of Legion, uh, it's, uh, which is Exorcist Three, is the way it's known now. Okay. Uh, but like, racial violence and hate crimes are a huge theme in that, and um. Um, and, and you know like sexual violence is 
kind of the dominant metaphor i think in the exorcist that like you know sexism and patriarchal violence is such a major theme of that text you know the way in which like you know a girl is victimized and people won't listen to yeah. her and uh you know like the mother is trying to get attention to it he 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 was a really systematic thinker about what evil is and it yeah. wasn't as simple for him as like oh it's all caused by demons we need to no like like the, again True. the demons are doing work for blady the demons yeah. symbolize the extent to which humans collaborate in like these macro uh structures with evil and the mm. way in which faith and a return to you know the, the 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 love of god and the love of jesus and the sacrifice of jesus is effective in actual fact for fighting these so like, he, he is right. a very systematic thinker i think um yeah. he's, he's a good catholic right <laughs> like, yeah, that's, but, uh, you mean, know, it, yeah. it, it's 100 percent fair for what you're talking about, because again, he doesn't treat Chris with contempt for being a single mom or being mm -hmm. divorced. Like he, and mm -hmm. so my mom and I, so I think women especially will like, we want to talk about a horror movie of like going through this diagnosis for yeah. themselves or their daughter. Like this is something that many women have lived through. It was something that mm -hmm. my mom went through. She's been since diagnosed with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, yeah. but she went yeah. through probably close to a decade where everybody's telling her it's in her head. Yeah. And yeah. not listening to her and the symptoms don't add up and blah, 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 blah. And so I think when I'm watching some of the medical scenes in that movie, I'm like, oh, my mom went through that. Yeah. Like, that, yeah. like and, and she wasn't possessed. Right. <laughs> like, but, but there's, but there's an actual problem that I don't know the degree to which he knew, cause I don't know as much about him that he was mm -hmm. shining a light on this systematic problem, this systemic yeah. problem of, of misogyny in medicine right of yeah. just doctors being like smoking a cigarette and being like hey sweetie don't worry about it just give her some pills and it'll be okay like that's very much how the doctors are portrayed yeah well, in a it, lot of ways yeah there's that wonderful shot of when they're all kind of sitting around telling her that like maybe she should just be committed there's this wide cut of chris is sitting in the middle it, she's wearing all black and there's like 20 men with identical haircuts and white coats standing around her and just like it just radiates this like uselessness and helplessness of the fact that like chris is the only one who doesn't look like them and she's the yeah. only one who's not in white and she's the only one like you know like being marked with like the black clothes right of yes. just sort of like which is foreshadowing the priests but yeah. also like is symbolic of this evil that's holding on to her that like the way it, and, and this is a part of why i think the characters of karis and Marin are so winsome and iconic is because like they're the first people who listen to this woman um yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of st bible stories that i think are plausibly alluded to in this the one that blady openly talked about was the um was the gathering swine mm -hmm. that he de he imagined the end of the story as being like a a, a redux of like the crucifixion yeah. plus the gathering swine the way that the demon is ultimately defeated uh but i think another really plausible one is the canaanite woman from mm -hmm. matthew or the syrophoenician woman from mark this you know gentile who is uh you know not part of the jewish people and who has a demonized daughter and follows jesus begging for help and you know they, they there's this response of you know let the children eat all they need first because it's not right to save the children's bread and throw them to the dogs so you, people probably know this story i think that's chris feels a lot like that woman to me that yes. she is yes. um th that that she she goes to Karis and she stays on him in like Karis's little faith crisis of, you know, like, I don't really know if this is a good idea. And like, there are no experts that like, that doesn't really deter her. And, and she's, she has this amazing scene where, you know, when she finally goes to Karis and she's asking, you know, she's got, um, she's got big sunglasses and a big hat on because she's a famous actress and she doesn't want anyone to recognize him, her. And, um, and she's talking to Karis maybe you should take her to a psychiatrist and chris just snaps because she's she's at this point she says she's taking reagan to 87 doctors yeah. and she just starts like screaming at him that like i go to 87 doctors and they tell me to go to a priest and then i go to a priest and you tell me to go to a psychiatrist yeah right it just 
and, and, and I love that, like, it, it really puts Karis in his place, right? Mm-hmm. That, like, she's tried. She's thought of it. She doesn't need somebody to be like, have you considered this as a mental problem? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and, and, and Karis learns, right? He never does it again. He, uh, he, he, he He's respectful. And I, I think that's a huge part of why those characters are so winsome, that she is so tenacious, but he's also... He, he's also growing and changing with her yeah, right that he, he he's not disrespectful he doesn't blow her off he doesn't think she's crazy um he's just limited because his faith is really weak and of course there's this little problem that uh there are no exorcists anymore yeah, right, right? right so we don't yeah. we don't have that ma'am like i yeah. know that's <laughs> what you're ordering but we don't have that oh uh, but he does have compassion and mm-hmm. his compassion is so different. And I don't think it's a like science versus faith thing. I don't think that's mm-hmm. necessarily what we're trying to set up. But the way that the the men of science and medicine deal with it mm-hmm. versus the way a man of faith deals with it is that there's ba- there's supposed to be, I'll say there's supposed to be mm-hmm. baked in compassion to the faith. And yeah. I think of so many messages that we hear now about what it means to be a man of God and it means Mm. to be ready for violence Mm -hmm. and ready for this. And then you're looking at something like this where there's clearly a man who's, I mean, he's a former boxer, right? That's the whole thing that they talk about with him. is like, he looks like a boxer. Like they're alluding to this idea that he's not just like some weird, timid priest, which is a lot of times the like stereotype of what that looks like. Yeah, But he's he's really led by his compassion to go beyond his doubt. Right, yeah. like his compassion leads him beyond his doubt, and I, th- mm-hmm. I think Jesus would probably be like that. Yeah, that's how yeah. it works. Like it, doubt, he's not condemned for the doubt, but his compassion leads him beyond it. Like you said, by a woman who does not believe yet mm-hmm. has the faith to ask for mm-hmm. someone to remove this demon. Yeah, and like which, which is kind of a like tension mind-blowing kind of thing of like yeah i'm not religious i don't believe in this but my daughter has a demon in her and i need somebody to remove <laughs> exactly and, like, and i don't know who else to do this except the priest right and um yeah. and, and i also think that like i think blady was really d- deliberate in the way he creates damien that damien is sort of a um you know i think at the time this was sort of a th- this is an era of like developing urbanization and yeah. you know damien's a bronx kid right mm. he's a he, he's a second generation italian yeah, immigrant he's an immigrant yep yeah he's a rough boy he's a boxer he's like you know there's kind of an implication he used to be kind of trouble right yeah. you know but he's um b- but he is but he is kind and he is he understands how he is supposed to respond to people who are sick and who are in who need help and and he has this fundamentally empathetic compassionate core at the heart of these seemingly rough edges yeah right um which you know is just part of what makes his character so so appealing and so yeah. you know why he's so iconic and um yeah i i don't know um, i mean there's there, there's so much about that yeah that part of the story and you know again part of what has frustrated me a little bit with you know sort of the the legacy sequel right of the exorcist Mm -hmm. is sort of the idea that you know when you watch people talk about how they're going to make this movie is like you know we wanted to bring in like you know critical like modern issues of gender into the exorcist like what are you talking about did you not did you not see the exorcist like yeah it's already there and it's not only already there just because we haven't done anything better as a society doesn't mean that we have to change how we bring it in like i think a woman could i haven't seen the legacy sequel yet i need to go see it yeah but i like i think a lot of women of all kinds of backgrounds would relate to chris or and or yeah and, yeah. and other characters in the movie even a father Karis. like yeah i think it's relatable what they would see with power dynamics and everything else and so mm-hmm. the idea and the line that, you, that keeps pissing you off that has gotten you <laughs> on a twitter rant has been like i would have been in the room but for the patriarchy i know which, uh, it so, feels so it... antithetical one to the character that, do- yeah. that doesn't feel like something that chris would not say. chris no it doesn't feel like what she would say and then two you're like well, you're not in the room because you're not an exorcist. <laughs> like, right. That, like, yeah. That, ugh, 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 so ugh. that's a line from the legacy sequel, and it drives me insane because it's so antithetical to 
not just a Chris, but the relationship she has with the people in the first story. You know, it's like it's just the, the the real Chris would never say yeah. it, so to speak, because yeah. Chris under you know in, in the story part of what part you know why why the story is so moving and why I think we keep going back to The Exorcist is that ultimately The Exorcist is in addition to being scary, it's a great drama it is yes. thematically very rich but these all feel like real characters and all mm -hmm. their relationships are really deep and rich and karis being this you know navigator of this you know outdated system for chris and trying to figure out how to get chris her exorcism is really powerful and really moving and is is this sort of like crazy east meet east meets west with you know with with, with marin being brought into this and yeah. sort of like old meets you know like the the first time yeah. the first time chris asks how do you go about getting an exorcism karis kind of thinks she's putting him on a little bit and says well the first thing you're going to need is a time machine yeah. uh because like they don't they don't do this right do <laughs> yeah and, and you know and, and of course what he realizes is that she's not putting him on she's being completely sincere yeah. because she personally needs one but but i, I like the, it's those little like human moments that i think make the story work that like mm. you believe so much these are real people you yeah. know like there's a part of me that like honest to god thinks i'm gonna like meet father cares in heaven someday <laughs> like that like yeah, he feels right? really so real to me even though i know yeah. he's, obviously he's not but uh, but he's see me it's so good to see you see me <laughs> oh he's so real to me because he's just such a well-done character and and i think part of what um i have not seen the exorcist 2 uh i have seen i i have seen exorcist 3 uh which is a really interesting movie because it's one of two movies that blady himself directed as opposed oh. to just wrote uh yeah. you know blady uh Friedkin directed The Exorcist. Uh, yeah. Blady, and, and then Blady eventually. Um, if if you if you've if you've seen the version that's called the version you've never seen, the kind that was re released in two thousand, that was the version that Blady um, had some of his scenes that he wrote put back in that mm. weren't actually in the original. So that's a little bit more like. There's sort of the freed conversion of the Exorcist. I think Friedkin is more comfortable with the ambiguity and sort of yeah. like the, the 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 evil and the darkness, whereas like Blady has much more of a theological. So um, right. there's a really famous scene in The Exorcist where uh, uh where where uh Marin it's it's is it's in the book and then it's um where Marin is explaining to Damien why possession happens. That you know I think the idea is that. I can't quite remember the line, but I think it's the goal is to make us see ourselves as animal and ugly and to despair that God could truly love us. And mm. I think ultimately faith is not a matter of what is it? Faith is ultimately a matter of love. It is about believing God loves you. Yeah. So there's a there's a lot there's a scene in the movie that Max von Sydow delivers that monologue and it wasn't in the original version. If you so if you see it now in a movie, you're seeing the the, the version that Blady had it put back in in the 2000s. Um, the other one that Blady, the other scene Blady had put back in when he sort of got editing cut, uh, editing rights for this new re-release version, is uh, the Spider Walk. Yep. The Spider Walk is not in the original. I remember the, uh, that one because that that was re-released <laughs> when I was in college. Yeah. And, uh, I think we went to see it, or some roommates went yeah. to see it, and that was like one of the big advertising pieces of like The Exorcist, yeah. like you've never seen it before. Yeah, it's a crazy effect, which I think is why he had it put back in there is just because the the effect is really good. That's um, that's a gymnast uh who she has a she has a back brace on that's dangling her from the ceiling so she's not putting actual pressure on her wrist so it looks lighter than it's supposed yeah. to um and they just have this girl run down the stairs and scream and uh Oof. you know playing reagan and it, it looks great it looks fantastic it's an absolutely wonderful effect uh yeah. free can cut it because he didn't think Reagan should leave the room once she's been possessed he thought that it, all the action should stay in the bedroom um I respect it. It's it's a it's it's a good effect. It yeah, looks it's a great really effect. good. It's a great <laughs> like, uh, and it's in the book. In the book, um, in the book, it's a more extended scene where Reagan is kind of like following people in the house around, doing a spider walk for a while. Mm. It's just you know. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's 
some of the images in the book you probably could not put into film. The, the, I actually, the, the book is, the book is gnarlier. It can be, you yeah. know, because you don't actually have to look at it. But you know, but the, it's pretty faithful. So yeah. yeah, it's a when you're so when you take a movie like this. So as somebody who is an, I would say like an expert, right? You're an yeah. expert <laughs> in crafting <laughs> curriculum and thinking about the problems and. Sorry. the questions and what these kinds of movies bring up like when you take a movie like the exorcist like if you were teaching mm -hmm. a class on it which maybe you already have but like I if did, you're teaching yeah, a class yeah. on it yeah what are you like what are you encouraging people to look at what challenges yeah. do you have for them what what applications yeah. do you have yeah, so we uh, we opened with this last time I taught religion and film. We opened with this movie. Um so we Basically, I, 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 we took it a few different ways. One was just diving into the story and we focused a lot on the thing I really encourage people to, to do was to focus on um, Chris and Damien character arcs. That's what I was just sort of thinking. It was like, you know, let's this is ultimately a story about growth and change primarily for Damien, but Chris also has a really critical arc in this story, yeah. right? And um, in going through that of trying to think through who's the protagonist. So we, we talked about that and particularly the, the ways in which Damien's faith changes in response to other characters acting mm. in the story, right? You know, because like Marin has this very central role of being kind of the person who breaks this open for Karis, yeah. right? Is the person who's able to make this, to, to make his faith something that's real again. Um, and then we also, we, we also did a, a big series on the afterlives of the exorcist, right? So we talked about deliverance ministries. We talked about uh, the rise of demon language and media phenomenon. And then we talked about the satanic panic and we, and we talked about the Mick Martin trials, right? And, um, you know, obviously the exorcist is only one part of that story. A lot of that stuff you could also trace to, um, like the Mansons, but it sure. is part of that story. Right. Um, but you know, I don't, the thing I don't, I, the afterlives of the exorcist are really important. I, and I think that's really critical. Um, I think the question the discussion question of whether or not the exorcist is effective at what Blady wanted it to be at is what I think is just ultimately the most interesting question about the exorcist. That, that to yeah. me is like, that is the question of the exorcist for me is, does it inspire feelings of courage and faith and confidence in yeah. love of God? Uh, yeah. And why or why not? Because like, I, I had a really unusual experience with the exorcist for the first time is that like, the first time I saw it for the first time when I was in grad school, I, I, I was like you, I had put it off a long time because I just heard it was so scary. And, um, and my, my sister had actually been really disturbed by it. And it was just mm -hmm. sort of like, I don't think anyone needs to see that movie. And, um, I watched it in grad school. Um, I was watching it with a group. I fell asleep while it was on after like 10 minutes and like woke up when it was over. I was like, oh man, but I still had the DVD because I checked it out from the library. So the next morning I just put it on by myself at my house just to like see what all the fuss was about. And I was, I don't know if it was just this context of watching it on a Saturday morning with my coffee for the first time. I was riveted. I was, yeah. I was, I, I had exactly the experience Blady wanted me to have. And I think there's a few different things going on. I think that like I was older, I wasn't that disturbed by it, but also I was like, you know, go grad school for religious studies can be really rough on your faith. Yeah. And I think that for me, I was really wrestling with the fact that a thing that had really been like the cornerstone of my Christian experience, the Bible, I was now like reading it in this really different way and it was challenging me. And I think that just like, falling into the story with a character with characters who I loved who were going through the same things or whose faith wasn't really dependent on academic concerns, but just on like showing up and doing the right thing. I had exactly the experience Blady wanted me to have. I yeah. watched it like twice in a row that day. I was completely, I called my sister. I was like, you have to watch this movie again. I yeah. know it disturbed you. Now it's one of her favorite movies, but I just, I, I got exactly what I was supposed to get out of it. Mm. And I don't think I, I do not have a normal exorcist story. Yeah. Right. And, and that's how <laughs> that happens to most people. And, uh, and it still is, it is by far my favorite movie of all time. And I think a big part of that, you know, cause like I do get reactions to that along the lines of, you know, 
you know, isn't it, isn't it so demonic? Isn't it so disturbing? And just like, all I can say is that like that movie was there for me in a time in my life where I needed it to be. And it yeah. still is. It's still a really anchoring, inspiring, encouraging movie for me. And I appreciate the fact that I have the definition of a minority experience in yeah. The Exorcist. Right? Well, it's perfect <laughs> because there's two funny things about it. One yeah. is that you, you like found it so peaceful that mm -hmm. like that, that it was faith affirming right mm -hmm. that it was like i watched the exorcist then the second part is that grad school was so tough on your faith because that's so true <laughs> like I know. It, you, yeah. you you took you were like you know what i need after a tough like semester of grad school i need to watch the exorcist I need, I need to unwind with it. It. <laughs> that's like that's so good I still do that. I still actually like there's a real like warm bath relax feeling that like sometimes when I'm just like when I just like it, it doesn't even have to be like I'm going through something. Sometimes when I just need it, I just watch the last 20 minutes of the exercise. <laughs> like, yeah. I watch Marin show up and do his thing. Yeah. I watch I watch him suit up. I watch Karis dig deep and be the hero he needs to be, you know. Um the power of Christ compels you is the first time yeah. he really like stands up and acts like an exorcist, right? Instead of a terrified psychiatrist, right? You right. know, it's, um, it's great. I find it incredibly moving and I just, I, I love the story. And, um, yeah. And, and I don't, I, I don't, I, I, I've been kind of playing into the medical thing a lot. I don't think it has to be a, like a faith and science thing because like, it, yeah. because I think in the story, it's not really, there, there's two things going on one is that the problem is faith-based right yeah. and the the part of the storytelling mechanism is that to get the exorcism you have to prove there's yeah. nothing medically wrong right so that yeah. so that's a huge part of why the story is told the way it is um not that like doctors are like bad in the story it's just that they you have to prove that they can't solve it to get the exorcism yeah. but then a big part of it is you know and I was thinking about this a little bit with the belief, the exorcist believer line of, you know, that they wouldn't let me be in the room because of the patriarchy that just like at the end of the day, this is a story about characters and the characters do represent things. But I don't think that it's as simple as the messaging is that like doctors are sexist, but priests are not right. It's just like this is a story about these two priests mm. and these two priests who are very who who do have deep empathy for yeah. others and who aren't judgmental of moms who are in entertainment and who don't think that Chris must be a bad mom for the stab. Like these are the priests we we meet in the story, right? And yeah. and, you know, and and Blady wasn't an Blady wasn't an idiot. You know, he he explores more of the world of faith and its downsides around it. And then of course there is also the other part of the Catholic Church in the story isn't just these priests. It's this big institution that won't give chris the exorcism that you know so so, so yeah. the, it, the portrayal is complicated but ultimately it, it's it's about these two men and yes. how they respond to it and, yeah. and they're they are i think a really inspiring set of characters because they are so um be, because they are they are so fully realized and especially in the case of karis um because he he has such a long way to go to yeah. be able to be the person he needs to be to solve this and we get yeah. to watch him do that yeah it's, it's, um... a, but it's a great point though that they're people first and pre-second mm -hmm. yes right? and yeah and because it's not like you said too, i mean if you want to talk about patriarchy like medicine and religion are two mm -hmm. of the, like yeah biggest, exactly like <laughs> patriarchal institutions that we have in the world in this country yeah. especially but yeah. the point isn't oh patri like the church good medicine mm -hmm. bad it, to your point it's just yeah. that somebody somebody listened to chris and yeah. in, in the story that he wanted to tell it's the priest that listens mm -hmm. and yeah. you get the empathy and compassion yeah and, and you do have you know kinderman is introduced in this book and then he becomes a major character later in the series in legion uh because you know kinderman is a jewish character he's the officer um and he he eventually becomes a you know a, a full character in his own right who has his own perspective on what evil is and in that is given serious engagement you know um kinderman is a um 
he's the guy who throughout the book and the novel is kind of indicated to be a very lonely person he's the uh he's the um anyway, yeah this is part of why the exorcist is such a good story is because it kind of has this happy ending element that uh mm-hmm. kinderman is uh this very like lonely man who can't really get anybody to hang out with him essentially is a big part yeah. of his character and then at the end father dyer damien's best friend damien Karras's best friend uh is left alone and grieving after the re- events of the story and then kinderman pulls up and invites him to a movie and like so we have this like you, you know I, there, there's a lot of different elements of this story that like yeah, yeah that, that it's not just about you know like going to the priest and getting your answers it's about community and like friendships across faith is like all part of this vision of overcoming evil in the story that's really beautiful that um yeah that, that, there's even a resolution for kinderman can't get someone to go to the movies with him right like that's <laughs> Yeah, well, that's actually yeah. a really cool piece about the community because there really is like a weird patchwork community around this because you have Sharon, who's <laughs> the like babysitter, like au pair kind of character, yeah. and you've got the housekeepers and you've got these other, uh, the other folks from Georgetown, like you said, Father Dyer, and you've yeah. got like just these people circling the the mm-hmm. story and that community piece is pretty brilliant. And in the... um in the book i can't i i think she's in the movie but you have the psychic mm-hmm. right the me the spiritualist yeah. and like there's yeah. just a bunch of people who are in this orbit and it's yeah. very human like you said very yeah. human yeah that, like we we believe these are people who are living there who, who have lived in dc a long time and these are their networks right and these are yeah. the people they you know and then kinderman eventually comes back through as a character because of that that role um do you know the story of the ending that was written but not shot for the exorcist no, no tell so me this is it. this is another one of those like great uh bible references in it was that it was supposed to be the end that father dyer you know so i guess spoilers for the exorcist but i'm kind of assuming people know the outline of what yeah. happens in it but father dyer is back at the track where damien used to train and he's grieving and he's sad and like so there's sort of this window of hope for him that he's going to have this new connection with kinderman which we later find out in legion that they become friends for like 20 years like that actually does happen it's what, but he's grieving the loss of his friend at georgetown and he sees this man out training on the track and the f- friend comes up and says things that sound very damien he, he doesn't know this man he's a stranger on the track who's training yeah. and he says things that sound very damien ish and basically tells dyer that i'm at peace it's okay and then jogs away so this was supposed to be the take on the Emmaus Road scene in mm. the Gospel of Luke, that Dyer at the end is comforted by Damien in another form, who God sends back to assure Dyer that he's yeah. okay. So the the reason why the, Blady, Blady wrote this as the last scene, because he was worried that there wasn't enough assurance that Damien's sacrifice was not in vain and that he was at peace, because... um. In the book, when Damien dies, Dyer hears his final confession, and Damien, it says in the book, has this like look of like transcendent joy on his face. Like mm-hmm. he knows he was successful and he knows he's going to heaven and everything's, you know, and, and he, he did what he had to do and he he's at peace finally, right? Yeah. And of course, we can't that wasn't shown in the movie because it would be really hard for that actor to do that with the like brain. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> With the uh the the you know we don't see damien's face when he dies in the movie um because of the way the effect has to be put right Mm -hmm. so that was you you know there is an indication of just sort of like the ultimate piece for all these characters both in dyer making this new connection with this new friend um and then of course reagan um Reagan saying she doesn't remember any of it, but then reagan kissing father dyer uh on the cheek when they leave which suggests that she she does remember one thing yeah. which is that this man died to save her right yeah. and like and she recognizes the collar um so there is this indication that like what damien did is not going to be forgotten and that mm-hmm. it was like but but I, I i like that the emmaus road ending of just sort of an indication that 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 damien was okay yeah. right that that god 
did come through for Damien and that Damien is in heaven and at peace and is able to reassure his loved ones that he's, I, I think it's a cool ending. I think it's very yeah. sweet. And it's also just one more little, there's so many Bible illusions in it and it's just one, one really good one. <laughs> yeah. So, That's a really cool one. And it, it yeah. definitely plays upon the sacrifice in the right way. Cause there is something mm-hmm. Jesus-y about Karis. Oh, in yeah. How, yeah. In how the in how the poor and the hurting and the mentally ill are drawn to him. Yes. And they, yeah. they just are drawn to him. And mm-hmm. the book really highlights that super yeah. deeply well. And the movie has the scene in the mental institution. Yeah. Uh, when he comes to see it. And, and it it's overwhelming and it's played for scares in yeah. the in the film. But there there's a real like anybody who's ever been a, a pastor or like you, a chaplain knows that feeling yeah. that he feels yeah. in that room of just yeah. like a bunch of people coming towards you that need something from you and you're just like yeah ah, it's yeah. overwhelming yeah uh, and damien's like so weighed down by it so you know yeah, yeah. That, that that is another i mean there's there's a lot of like christ imagery with damien you know and in the way his i mean his last name is karis grace sure. you know which is pretty on the nose but uh, yeah. So, yeah um it's pretty straightforward yeah, no, exactly. But I, I think there there is this sort of idea that, y- y- you know, that, that we are supposed to see him as this sort of like self-sacrificing hero character. But then, yeah. you know, I, I do like, I, you know, it's it's hard in the movie for him to get his due of the assurance that he that he 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 goes on in some way right mm-hmm. so and again that would be another thing that kind of strengthens the jesus connection is that there would be a basically a resurrection at the end right that yeah, uh right. You know, not that karis was actually raised but that karis is you know karis is living on in some yeah. really important well, way yeah and that's so. one of those like what we would say in evangelical churchy kind of circles now is that somebody mm-hmm. maybe got a word to share right yeah so it's a little less yeah. catholic but somebody walks over and goes hey i just needed to tell you that your friend says he's at peace and that it yeah. was all worth it or whatever yeah. and it would mean something to the person but the person delivering yeah. it has no idea and it's yeah. just like i know yeah, it's yeah. a significant thing yeah, 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 and of course, like in, in the way Blady had it, is that it is it is Harris himself transformed, right? Which mm. is a much more, you know, it, it's much more playing on the resurrection idea, right? Yeah. That you know that 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 Jesus' disciples don't recognize Jesus That's after true. he's raised, and that and that the idea of, with that being that like Harris. It is in some way raised, but is fundamentally transformed, and his disciples don't recognize him now. But that, that, it, it would have been a really interesting ending, and I, I, I'm a little sorry they didn't do it, but I also get why they didn't, right? Yeah. You know that the the movie they kind of get us right out of that after the exorcism, and Reagan reveals that what she actually does remember, and then you know, and then Kinderman and uh, Dyer go see a movie together, and you know which is such a funny ending to like such a scary movie i know like (laughs) hey you want to go catch a movie like there's a little casablanca of like i got the feeling this is gonna be a start of a beautiful relationship right exactly yeah well and then they become the sequel characters right that uh you know the 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 later movies are about the later stories are about them Um, i still need to i still need to see the sequels i haven't seen them and then i need to see the new one because that, yeah. that looks actually pretty interesting, besides the patriarchy there's, part. There's a lot to talk about with the role. So my, my my big issue, here's the thing. The Exorcist works because it is a theologically straightforward story. That this is yeah. a this is a Catholic demon. This is a, you know, this is a demon who makes sense within a Catholic system. And and it's not I think the whole idea of this was this idea that, you know, like, well, all cultures have demons and exorcisms which is sure. is kind of true it's also kind of not true that you know like other other cultures have possessions but or like but they don't they're not always negative and but anyway so I, I think kind of building on this idea that there is this ontological reality of demons and like every culture has their own way of solving it yeah. i think that why that breaks down as an idea for me and why i don't think that is grounded and scary in the same way is that you know Okay, but then, who, but whose demon is this? Right? Sure, like, who's, sure. who, whose demon is it? Who, who, what belief system does this belong to? Yeah. Right, that you know, it's it's weird to me that you, you know, it, it to me it, it loses something of the grounding if a demon is both scared of crucifixes and holy water and also like incense and herb smoke. Right, right. It's like okay, 
who is demons are supposed to be like some opponent of the good what what sure. is this demon doing right especially because they call him pazuzu a few times right and yeah. it's like i know pazuzu it's just not skip salt right, right. <laughs> like, he's just like man yeah that that's to me that doesn't you know i don't know there, there's I, I, there's a lot you could do with the exorcist now, especially like with the idea of the, the declining role of Catholicism in American yeah. life, which, which was even kind of a theme in the 1973 that, you know, like, um, JFK was the first Catholic president, right? Like Catholicism was a highly minoritized religion for a lot of American history. So yeah. like, I don't think it's quite true that like, oh, this movie came from an era where Catholicism was dominant. Now it's not. I actually don't think that's true. I think that, you know, th there's a lot of the, the 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 liminal role that priests play in American life is kind of actually a running joke in The Exorcist, right? That, you know, like um when Kinderman first questions Damien about whether or not the Jesuits uh might have had something to do with one of the desecrations in town. He's like, no, but that sounds like the Dominicans, right? Yeah. And like Kinderman and Kinderman doesn't get it, right? It's just such an like... inside joke. <laughs> Actually, like Kinderman, Kinderman's Jewish, she doesn't get it, right? But um, but there's kind of that like I, I I think that's part of the world of the original Exorcist, and I think you could do something like that now. But I just you know, pluralism sure. in the Exorcist, I don't know why how they fit, right? I think I think yeah, it's a, well because yeah, you would have to. It's it's a at its heart a very like Catholic Christ Christ first story, mm -hmm. and so yeah. And so that's part, but I, I mean, there's so much interest in the decline of trust in the Catholic church since the yeah. abuse scandals yeah. and all the other things going on. Like the Catholic church is not where a lot of people would turn for safety or comfort. Yeah. And so I, I, yeah. Yeah. Can I pitch my exorcist sequel to you? Give it to me. This is my sequel. Okay. I think it should take place in today, 50 years after the original exorcist movie took place. And there are, there is a group of priests who remember Father Marin and Karis, but are like very disillusioned with the church because of their, you know, like the experience of like, of abuse and like being failed by religious yeah. leaders. And like, they're trying to help their congregants with it. And the like, there's a, there's a lot of tragedy there that like Marin and Karis feel a really long time ago. And like, they were kind of the last of their breed and they find out that there's an exorcism, but the that there's an exorcism that needs to happen they find out that somebody in one of their churches is being possessed but the hierarchy of the church is covering up for the demon like they cover up for abusers that's how no. i would do it that's how i would do it is make it a story about courage against is catholic priests needing to show courage against the institution and tell it like Whoa. an abuse story that's how i'd do it that i think it's a be... great i think it's a great yeah. idea <laughs> okay that would be amazing uh, trademark Dr. Yeah. Laura Robinson. Jordan Peele, call me. <laughs> yeah. Trademark Dr. Laura Robinson. Yeah. Please write that. Like, yeah, I think I it's a great idea. Yeah. I would love to see that. Yeah, no. Oh. Somebody, somebody get Jordan Peele on the phone now that Universal owns a. Universal owns The Exorcist, and Jordan Peele has a good relationship with Universal. Just send him my way, guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll try to make that connection so that we could get you. So that we could get you going. I think well, it's a great idea. I love it. Yeah. So, yeah. Doctor Laura, we could talk forever. Oh my gosh, I know. Right? Yeah. Unfortunately, I gotta get going. Go yeah. No. Same. Uh, and, uh, it's awesome. Well, we'll make sure that people can subscribe to your Substack. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Called not peer reviewed. Yeah. yeah, not peer reviewed. Definitely check it out. You had a great guide to scary movies that I think Thank we'll you. definitely link to yeah. how to watch in the spooky season, and we'll get yeah. this one out so that people can kind of brush up on The Exorcist. And maybe mm -hmm. I hope my hope for this is that somebody takes takes the plunge and watches The yeah. Exorcist. So if you're yeah. out there and you watch The Exorcist because of this, we'd love to talk with you about Just it. Just get yeah, give it a shot and reach out to us because I I love introducing people to this movie, into this book, into this like the the, the world of The Exorcist story. Yeah. Oh, it's a, dude, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. I wish we could find a way to watch it like together. Like I know. I could do a watch along. I know. We should look into this and see maybe like I wonder if other people would be interested in doing that, like doing sort of like a group conversation about. Okay. Oh, yeah, I, we'll I guarantee this. it.
Because I would yeah. love to have some horror people that are not people yeah. of faith to weigh in on like, what does this movie mean for not? How does this people? land for you? Yeah, because yeah. I can only come at from my perspective. Um, I, I would say uh, the review of uh, Red Letter Media, the people who did the really famous uh, Star Wars prequel movies, uh, they do a they do a discussion of The Exorcist between two guys who are not religious, and they it's it's really interesting just to hear a different perspective on it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Let's it's see a, if we can get a group watch together this month. Yeah. Look us up, guys. We would yeah. I love The Exorcist. Never get, I think it's on Max right now too. HBO yes. the Max app. Yeah. So That's where I watched it. Watch it on what Max. What are you waiting for? It's a great time to watch The Exorcist. Go dive so. in and we'll figure out a way that we can kind of watch it together this Sounds this great. spooky this spooky season. I love this. I love this. Hey, so Thank you, doctor. Awesome. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you so much for tuning into our conversation. Man, I loved talking to Dr. Laura Robinson about The Exorcist. She is brilliant and fascinating and so well-spoken and well-read and just really someone fun to talk to about The Exorcist and scary movies in general. And follow her Substack. You absolutely need to do that. And I'll put the details in the comments for her Substack and my Substack. If you want to talk more about scary movies, she also writes about Operation Underground Railroad and some other things going on. We both have some projects in the mix that are coming up. But if you want to watch The Exorcist with us, let us know. Man, thank you guys for hanging out.